Two Poor Bastards contains explicit content and drunken ramblings. Listener discretion is advised. Well, you, I mean, but you were sick the last time we were doing this. Oh, I'm still, still a little. <clears throat> but you're not uh, terribly sick. No, I'm not, I'm not dying like last time. That's good. I don't want you to die. I mean, at least before we, you know, get done recording this fucking episode. So we're going to talk about Russell's Reserve. We got a store pick uh, from our local West 7th Liquor Barrel. We are part of the Whiskey Club there. Great place. Buy your booze there. That, I buy booze there. Yeah. And that is not a paid endorsement. That is just our fan. I, I don't know. What I, li- I, don't know. I like it. I, I find it to be the best local liquor store. And the fact that we had a chance to get into their whiskey club is really awesome. Yeah. So plenty of benefits for us there since we're whiskey friends, drinking boys. Friends with benefits. So we're going to talk Friends about booze it fits. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about Russell's Reserve, the the store pick uh, that they got, and then we're going to talk about Berserk, the Golden Our Age or Golden Golden Age Arc. Golden Age Arc of Berserk, the movie that covers the 35 uh, manga parts, if you will. Uh, and then we'll, we'll just kind of that's mostly what we'll talk about tonight, and then we'll head into Got a few other random shit. So, uh, why don't you get off or get into the whisk, the juice, if you will? All right. So, if you don't know about Russell's Reserve, it is a wild turkey product. So, it's almost sort of like a premium version of the wild turkey, but not quite at the same level as, say, uh, Wild Turkey's Diamond release or any of the Master's Keep releases, um, maybe somewhere around Kentucky Spirit, that kind of thing, since it's a single barrel. So this guy here, the Russell's Reserve that we had, was picked out by the staff of uh, West 7th Liquor Barrel. And, um, and of course, because of that, it is a single barrel release. They got the whole thing comes with a fancy little tag on it, and it just tells us what the barrel number is, what Rick House it was aged in, what floor in the Rick House it was from. But what it doesn't tell us is how old the whiskey itself is. So, I mean, it's a non-age stated thing. They might have some information there somewhere of when it was barreled and when it was bottled, but we don't have that in front of us. Um <clears throat> I'm a big fan of the regular 10-year Russell's Reserve release, so I've got some pretty high hopes for this. I haven't sampled it yet. This will be my first time. Hopefully it will be a happy new thing like it was with the Abelora 16-year. Yes. But, um, I mean, other than that, you know, what can I say about it? Uh, It's considered a high rye mash bill it's like 75 percent corn 13 percent rye something like that yep and yeah let me read you off of the official wild turkey site so it says uh russell's reserve single barrel bourbon is matured only the deepest number four alligator char american white oak barrels handpicked by our master distillers individually bottled at 110 proof and non-chill filtered to guarantee maximum flavor. Each barrel has its own unique personal personality, excuse me, yet still captures our signature rich, creamy toffee and vanilla tastes. Some awards. So it's won gold medal, 2014 International Wine and Spirits Competition. It won 93 point excellent, highly recommended the 2013 Ultimate Spirits Challenge. And then 2013, it won the gold medal for San Francisco World Spirits competition. 
So there's a little little background there for you. We've uh, let the our glasses uh, breathe a little bit so we can get into the tasting. You ready? Let's, let's get into smelling this let's, bitch. Let's sniff it. Mm. I can smell the high proof right off the right off the bat. Yeah, it's still making this sick boy want to cough. Yep. Um, have you seen any of the Ali Wong specials on Netflix? Yeah, of course. So when you just said that sniff this, is this reminded me of one of her jokes about having to sniff her baby's butt to see if it had <laughs> shit or yeah. not. And she was talking about her husband. She's like, I never sniffed his butt, but I licked it. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't heard of Ali Wong, you're missing out. She's got two comedy specials on Netflix. I think we both highly recommend watching them. She's definitely I think right up our brand of humor of filthy rotten person. So yeah, that yeah, I'm pretty terrible, and she's she does a good job of being pretty terrible yeah, as well. My favorite kind of terrible. So this whiskey. <laughs> Anyways, we'll go back to that. Yeah. Still through my stuffy nose, I'm not getting a whole lot of what I should be. But it's almost candy-like yeah, smelling I, it from what I get. I get a little corn, the sweetness, as you say, maybe the candy. Like fucking candy corn smell almost. Yeah, a little bit. It's The high proof really like hits me in the back of the throat. I'm getting, I'm definitely getting some like toffee after scent I'm just going to get right into drinking this because I can't tell shit right, right now let's get it let's hit this big initially it's real sweet to me and then it goes from it transitions from sweet into heat Spicy. I would say spicy. You definitely get the definitely the high rye. What are the the cinnamon candies? The hot like red hots or red hot, hot tamales. I get a little bit of that. I do get a little red hots. The smaller ones. The little Yeah, the little red ones. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I hate cinnamon candy, by the way. <laughs> I don't hate this though. I I the spice for me it lingers probably the most out of everything. Like it's not quite peppercorn. Again, it's more like red hots than like a, a pepper sort of spice. Yeah, this is definitely really sweet. Almost it's I have to say this is almost to the point where I deem it to be too sweet. And the finish is rather abrupt too. Mm-hmm. You get it, and it just instantly just, like, cuts off, and that's it. There's no trail off or anything. So it's really, it's very candy-flavored. I almost wonder. This is something I won't say often. I almost wonder what this is would be like at a lower proof. I don't know that it would. I think it would probably go down a notch, because maybe the, the sweetness would be really overwhelming. Because the proof gives it the kick and kind of offsets the... I don't know, but the alcohol is also doing the sugary part, too. So. Mm. Why? Can you even get Russell's Reserve in a lower proof? I'm pretty sure the regular 10-year release of it is like 45, 45, 50% alcohol. I'm not okay. sure. All right. I don't know if it was if it was brought down a little bit. I wonder if it would take that sweetness edge off of it. So, for you, it's it's borderline too sweet. You're right on the cusp. Yeah, it's it's like I'm getting flashbacks of drinking Jameson until I'm sick because I think that stuff's too sweet now too when I drink it. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, I don't. Maybe a mixed drink Jameson would be okay, but it's a really sweet. 
it's a great to introduce yourself into whiskey. Yeah, and that's but it's exactly not. what it did. And I introduced myself from that a while ago. Yeah, it's it. But you have to close that phase of your life, and you have right. to move. You have to move on. You have to stop drinking Jack Daniels straight from the bottle because you think you're cool. Oh Jesus! I never. You're not if you do that. <laughs> you're an idiot, and you're probably 15. And Jack Daniels is fucking awful. So what's interesting to me is that, you know, a lot of times when people think of whiskey, they think of Jack Daniels, and I must be a marketing thing. Well, I mean, it's the whole, it's the Harley Davidson marketing of whiskey. Yeah, it's just trash. Yes. I, and and honestly, like, that is one of the things, and I've said this, I think I said this the first episode, I didn't start drinking until I was 25, and I'm all, God, that's so weird. I'm a lot older now, (laughs) but I tried other things, you know, like, I had beers or someone give me a shot of Jack Daniels, and it's disgusting. And so I just never really, I wasn't interested. And I'm just a stubborn bastard. So when I don't want to do something, I don't do it. Well, I, I hear you on that. So I, you know, I put off drinking for a long time, more, you know, a lot longer than your average person, I, really. Uh, About and 10 years more than your average person from what I gather. Yep, yep. I, you know, because I didn't even like, like I had, like, my family would think that they were funny and give, like, oh, hey, have taste this and they'd like have me have a taste of some awful redneck booze oh, and i'm man. like that's disgusting my parents definitely did that to me with some jose cuervo oh, when i was younger they're like taste this and it's just like Ugh. and for me like and slap slap in my face to try to get the flavor out i'm i'm like an elephant i have a very long memory and so those bad experiences or tastes of alcohol from when I was younger, just stuck with me until someone was like, you have to try this booze. And I got over it. Obviously here we are talking about it, doing a show on it. But, uh, so Jack, Dan, it just, it's, oh, it's just awful. It's just like a, ugh. but to be fair, I've only had the shittiest shit that they release. I haven't tried any of their but other it, things. It's so. so bad that I don't know that I would even want to try it. <laughs> But that's the attitude that I have. <laughs> it's like I, I have a good friend who lives down in Argentina, and he's all about Jack Daniels and getting all the special releases like the Sinatra ones and the single barrel versions and all that. And I'm every time I see him post a picture of this, I just want to be like, yeah, but it's Jack Daniels. So I don't know. Maybe some of that stuff is good. I feel like when you do that, like I interpret that as someone taking a picture of their shit. Like, look what I laid today. Yeah. Like here's a, <laughs> here's a picture of the turd. I just laid in the toilet. You'll, you'll like it. Please. Tur- turd photography is really what it is. is. Turd photography is not, <laughs> <laughs> not something I want to see. But then again, you know, like I said, I, I could just be a judgy asshole and, well, I think you know those experiences that you have with things make a lasting impression, and they can affect your entire introduction. Into, and maybe Jack Daniels has some really fucking good uh, higher end or res- reserved or whatever shit. There's probably some douchebag out there drinking nothing younger than 30-year-old McKellen saying, oh, everything else you drink is just absolute fucking garbage, too. So. Well, that's that's fair. That's absolutely fair. I think there's definitely... But back to this Russell's Reserve. How you feel about it now? I think, I don't know if my sickness is affecting me or what, but the, what I'm tasting right now, like, I could only see drinking this if, like, I needed something sweet, like I gotta have a dessert, but I don't have any chocolate or candy around. I would maybe go for this because it's just so sweet. I couldn't see myself just sitting down and drinking a bunch of this. So I like the fact that it's not a charry mess. So you don't get a lot of peat flavors out of it. You don't get a lot of. I don't get a whole lot of oak notes in this. Well, it's not really old enough for oak notes. It wouldn't have any peat flavor to it yeah so since I, pete's not anywhere involved in right the process but you know what I mean? like it's the i guess the essence of flavor uh i will say it's a sipping whiskey for sure you're not going to crank this down because the, the no pr- you gotta really sip this you'd be bla- your teeth would rot yeah 
I do, I do enjoy it. I, I would say it's as a dessert whiskey, if that, if that's such a thing. I'm enjoying it. I like, I like the balance of the little bit of toffee, the little bit of red hots. The I don't think it's super super sweet. I mean, it's sweeter. It's definitely uh, out of mm, the collection that I have. It's probably the sweetest mm-hmm. bourbon yeah, that I, I have. This is almost like a brandy or a cognac. But n- how nah. sweet it is. Ugh, brandy and cognac. Ugh. Hey man, it's just it's just too sweet. Like I. And to, to put things in perspective for all folks out there, I don't have a huge sweet tooth. Like, you know, I'll eat dark chocolate. Like, I like, like I don't like it super, super sweet things. So, um, I have a sweet tooth because I drink a lot. So <laughs> I taste the sugars in it. After a while, after a while of drinking, like if you're new to hard liquor and you drink it all you taste is alcohol but after a while you get the sweetness and the sugars out of it Mm -hmm. after you get some experience okay so what is your if you were to rate this what's your my final my my takeaway on this at least at the moment while i'm sick here it'd be like i could do without a bottle of this okay like it's it's all right it's good um, but you know that I have it, so if you ever had the urge, you can get right. it from me. I would like to have been on the group of people testing samples who are picking a barrel to know what the other ones taste like in comparison. So I'm curious. Do you think the the age has a large impact on the flavor of that particular whiskey? Like it's youth, I would say. It definitely does not taste young, so it's been properly aged. Okay. So it's that's it's not, not that, and I wouldn't expect a single barrel of Russell's Reserve to be too young either. I would say it's probably somewhere around the nine ten year range. So why then? So this is a so why is it not age stated then? Well, with. A, I mean, a fair amount of barrel picks, you're getting different ages. And, I mean, you're trying it out. Older doesn't always necessarily equal better. But, yeah, I mean, with a single barrel one, when they think, you know, it's you know, it's properly matured, this is its optimal thing, then it gets bottled. And I trust, trust those, um, you know, the Russell family and their, their palate and their taste. And when they... I would say if they feel something's good that I, I would generally believe them. So I don't think, you know, it's not like some boutique or artisanal part-time distiller, you know, jerk on our chains that has no idea what they're talking about. Like clearly they uh, know what they're doing. So yeah, I, I like it. It's not something again that it, it wouldn't be a go-to. Like this is not something I would mm-hmm. drink every day. This is not a like, it's definitely like a a taste or an urge less than like a, a go to thing. I I'm happy that I have it. I like it, um, but I'm not going to drink it every single day. Mm-hmm. Like as opposed to if I had this or just a bottle of the ten year regular Russell's Reserve, the non single barrel version, I could sit and drink the regular ten year until I pass out. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do it with this. Like, I'm having a hard time just getting through my initial pour. Really? See, I'm not having that issue at all. Like, I'm just, I'm pacing myself, obviously, because it's a little, it's obvious, it's a higher proof, but I'm not, there's no issue as far as um, get through it. I, I, I am enjoying it. Yeah, and I just ate, so there's no holding back for me. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay. Uh, what do you, what's your takeaway on this? Well, you know, as I said, it, it's not an everyday thing. It wouldn't be a go-to. Like, I feel that it is it is on the sweeter side, uh, but I do like the spice. Like, that is something that I genuinely enjoy about the uh, the whiskey, and I do like the fact that it's a higher proof. And, you know, like, and this might just me be me being cheap, but, you know, higher proof means less you have to drink to get drunk. So, uh you know, and this is something. Or the drunker you get. <laughs> oh, 
Fair. That's very fair. So there's a couple things I want to talk about, and maybe you've heard some of these things. Maybe you care or you do not care. So uh, right now the uh, Comic-Con is going on, and there's been some announcements of the things going on. Oh, I'll tell you one thing that I really fucking care about at Comic-Con this ooh, year. Do tell, please. Is Taco Bell. Oh, uh, yeah. Has a demolition man experience set up. So they opened up a, a like a pop-up Taco Bell to mimic the restaurant that was in Demolition Man, you know, when they went out to eat. Yeah, because it won the franchise wars. Because Taco Bell won the franchise wars. So in 2032, every restaurant was Taco Bell. And Taco Bell have a, they do a special menu for there. It's some fancy looking shit. So it's like, you know, when you go to a high class restaurant, a French restaurant, small portions, but presentation and all that and flavors are, you know, the main thing. So that's the menus like that. It's a four course meal that they serve. Hot damn. They have the motherfucker playing the piano from the movie in the restaurant, (laughs) playing the piano at the restaurant now playing the piano even they've got um props and costumes from the original movie set up in there as well is wesley snipes gonna make an appearance probably not fuck is he out of jail yet he's out of jail now yeah, right he's making movies again well that's super cool so so sorry that's the one thing i care about really at okay Comic-Con so that's this something year. that really got your juice going what about mr glass oh you don't give two shits about that no comment I watched the trailer. I didn't. I didn't watch Split. I'm not a huge M Night Shyamalan. Like the only thing that I do, and I, I do a joke where I say my penis is like a Shyamalan movie. It has a big twist at the end. <laughs> 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 That's the only time that like I'll reference. Shyamalan or Shyamalan. So at the beginning, people are into it. They're interested. <laughs> yeah. It garners a little bit of uh, you know interest. And then towards the end, people are just like, oh, fuck this. Yeah, that's my life. I feel that, especially that's my dating life. So uh, th- I, I watched the trailer. It was interesting. I mean, I don't know. Bruce Willis, I still kind of just have a, a love for him and in that sort of thing. And I, I don't I'll probably see it, but I'll probably see it on Netflix when it comes out. <coughs> and then you saw me. that there's a new Dragon Ball movie coming out. Yeah, Did Dragon you? Ball Super movie with Brawly in it again. Yeah, so they which is like the least, inter- in my opinion, the least interesting uh, Dragon Ball villain, I guess you could say. So apparently they <clears throat> they take him, they reimagine him a little bit and give him a fully fleshed out story and the creator of Dragon Ball apparently was very heavily involved in this particular movie. Okay. So apparently he had stepped away for a bit and then he's come and this is like this takes place after the newest series. So it's just like what's canon now with Brawly? I don't know. Was the original movie going to stay that or are they Fine. axing that and now it's just uh, I don't fucking know. Anyways, I thought you being a Dragon Ball fan that I would I'd So Ball. You know, interesting things I see on the internet. Lots of memes. Someone posted this thing where it's like, okay, here's the new Brawley movie. It's like, okay, so Vegeta... Or not Vegeta, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, Frieza Frieza killed, you know, most of the Saiyans. Okay. Oh, hey, there's Vegeta. Oh, you defeated Frieza. Yeah, Goku and my son. (laughs) Defeated Frieza. And they're like, oh, okay, that's cool. So you guys are, hey, wait a minute. Who's that standing over there? Is that Frieza? And they're like, yeah, we're friends with him now. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's the most Dragon Ball thing ever. Like, that's, that seems to be a loop. Remember, like, Piccolo was the villain yeah, in the I mean, first series. Yes, and then, you know, he's a good guy. And then Vegeta was a bad guy. And now he's a good guy. So now Frieza's going to be the bad guy. And he's going to be a, a good guy. What is this? I don't know, like, and I don't ever really feel, like, we've discussed this before, where, like, Ve- you know, Vegeta isn't necessarily a good guy either. He's just kind of, like, he acknowledges that, oh, he's a good guy. Do you think he's, I, I guess I haven't watched. Yes, he is. Fuck. He has a heart. I don't have one of those, but he does. Fuck. Well, you know what? There's a terrible tragedy in store for you, because if he can have a heart, then so can you. No. I refuse. Piccolo's a good guy for sure. 
Yeah, I don't know. What the fuck? But I don't know. What do I know? I'm a grown-ass man talking about Dragon Ball right now. So, <laughs> Well, I think you and every other grown-ass man of a certain age group is also talking about Dragon Ball. Well, so. right, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing that I saw, I saw a teaser trailer for Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery. I, myself, am a Star Trek fan. I mean, I am definitely a Next Generation fan. I have been recently wa- been watching Enterprise with my girlfriend, and uh, you know, Scott Bakula. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, Scott Bakula. I and I know that Discovery is a very controversial Star Trek series, so it's a it's a web only series, and it takes place before the original series, and it takes some narrative. Uh, it basically like I kind of kills everything that you know about Star Trek and just it just flushes it down the toilet because it takes place during the wars with the Klingons. So it's a war. The first season is a war. It's the Federation at war with the Klingons. So I think you know it's not all peace and love and making making sex with aliens. So races. there's a there's a Federation at this time because in Enterprise that I'm watching now, there is no Federation yep. yet. There, there's a Federation. Uh, I believe Captain Pike is flying around at this particular time. This is like, this is not that far off of the original okay. series. And uh, so, and it was really badass. They said fuck. Whoa. In discover in the series, they, uh, it was violent. And it had some really good. I really enjoyed it. It did. So it took a lot of risks and remixed your expectations of what Star Trek was, and then made it like modern and up to date. And I enjoyed that. I again, I appreciate anyone or any creative force, be it movies or TV or whatever, taking something that you love and remixing it and taking taking it a different direction. So I liked it. Season two, I'm really jazzed for because it seems that it's gonna head more into the direction of the original series, but keep a lot of its... It's going to be maybe a little lighter tone, maybe? Less swear words? Maybe. Or more swear words? I'm not sure yet. I, I really have Curse words. <laughs> curse words. Uh, so with this, Brian Fuller is not doesn't have anything to do with it, because Brian Fuller, when he was originally working with Alex Kurtzman, wanted to do an anthology series. So each season would take place during a different time period okay. in Star Trek. Well, ultimately, I think, and maybe rightfully so, like having to redesign everything each season was probably cost prohibitive to do. Because, shit, it's only released on CBS's web service. So it's not like it's a main... It's extremely well done. Like, it doesn't look cheap at all. and it's So it's definitely not fan-made. <laughs> quality of that. It's, no, it's really good. It, uh, You know, I think the actors are fucking great in it. I really have, I honestly don't have any complaints about the first series and where they're going with it, and I'm excited for uh, season two. So, uh, that those are just a couple of things that I peruse through. So, the main subject for tonight, what we want to get into, something that you turned me on to. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I think I started watching the original series a really long time ago. I may have gotten through it, but this is like 16 years ago or whatever. I mean, this series came out in 1997. 97, the original series aired. So uh, we are talking about Berserk. Berserk is a long-running anime series that started in 1989. And it's had a television series made from it of the original run of manga, a three-film series on the Golden Age arc, Mm -hmm. and then there's a season two, which I know is controversial. We're going to talk about the films. So um, a little bit of background on Berserk. So as it says, it's uh, set in a medieval European-inspired dark fantasy world. Uh, the story pretty much revolves around Guts and Griffith and their exploits as part of the Band of the Hawk is written by written by Kentaro Mira Miro is the original that's the guy that created Mira Mira 
Uh, that's the guy who wrote the manga. Perpetual hiatus man with, in terms of when it comes to writing out the still going uh, manga series. Yeah, it's, it's, I will tell you, like, it is one of the most adult anime manga series that I've, an adult in a sense of not dealing with, like, heady existential things that a lot of Japanese anime deal with, but just in the sense of, like, violence and disturbing shit that's happening. Yes, yeah, it deals with a lot of a lot of not good stuff. So the Golden Arc series is three movies, and the first movie is called The Egg of the King. That came out in February 2012. Uh, the, the second film is The Battle of Doldry, came out in June 2012, and then the final movie, The Advent, came out in, in February 2013. And it covers the 35 issues of what is considered the Golden Age arc. So the Golden Age arc, that that aspect of it. So as the story has been progressing, different parts are called different arcs. Like you get later on, there's like the Lost Children arc, or there's the Boat arc that we're currently on, and that kind of thing. But uh, the Golden Age one, I feel, went a little longer than the others, and it's basically like the telling, the greatest story ever told, is what I like to refer to it as. Yes. It is the telling of like how Guts, um, a young mercenary, ends up joining up with this mercenary band, the Band of the Hawk, who's led by a very charismatic leader by the name of Griffith. And so it goes from how Guts joins that... Um, his development as, you know, a hate-filled person who wants to be by himself to being someone who finally finds his place in life, then to feeling betrayed and having to leave in order to, you know, be an equal with his, his what he considers his friend Griffith, and then what happens with what Griffith does with things. So, as you'd mentioned earlier, it's seen as like a medieval storytelling. Um I feel like the series progresses it starts out as say a medieval style story and then goes straight into horror. I will it turns agree into you. horror. So, it's interesting cuz you talked about a meme that someone sent you where it's a dude standing in front of a mirror and he's wearing a tuxedo yes. and then the, the mirror reflection it's just his, like his bare ass on the backside. So that the first two movies really don't prepare you for what is going to come in the third movie. Uh, it really plays out like a, a rise of someone who's really ambitious and really charming. And it's the story of that person and guts. So Griffith is the, the up and comer who works his way through uh, a political monarch system from just being a, leader of a mercenary group to being a knighted, venerated... Uh, appointed a noble. A noble. Even. And... Promoted to the highest rank of general within the country as well that he's serving under. So, and we get sort of like the first movie, it's, it's as you said, it's Guts. He's a, a mercenary. And, like, this dude wields a gigantic fucking sword and... Like, you get the sense that he is the most brutish, powerful mercenary around. And the movie doesn't really go super into Guts's past. It kind of skims through some of that stuff. But what yes, you, you, it does glance over that real quick. Real quick. And what you, you get the, him initially being inscribed, I would say, because basically Griffith, Griffith, and Guts, they fight, and then basically says, Griffith says, if I win, you belong to me. And he loses, and then basically is forced into this new way of life, and works as, he himself, Guts, works his way through the Band of the Hawk, becoming a commander mm -hmm. of the Raiders, and being one of the most powerful... And beloved people within it, too. Within it. And so... At one point through the series, he becomes, you know, the killer of a thousand or killer of a hundred men, and you don't really get to see a lot of his his inner reasoning why, just that he has the drive to 
ki- not kill, but be successful and to... Well, at that particular scene, he had a reason to fight these hundred people because he was trying to help Casca yeah. escape. So there's and there's a, a whole colorful group of people in the movie. So Casca plays another controversial figure. She's a female commander in a medieval style story. Yeah. So, so she, yeah, basically, she within all of the band of the Hawk mercenary group is the number two person behind Griffith. Right. And she is scorned by all the other warring factions for being a woman. And, you know, basically because of her gender, she's unable to Dis- be... Yeah, despite all that being completely battle-proven. Right. Uh, and, I, you know, there's a lot of... I do like... And I, you know, I, I'm blurring the series and the movies now because I've, now I'm starting to watch the series behind the movies. Mm-hmm. But... It's interesting, you know, the initial dynamic between Guts and Griffith is initially one of, like, respect, and then it seems like it grows into, like, a, an actual love. I'm not going to say what kind of love, just a, there's some sort of thing that's deeper than camaraderie, and then there's a relationship between Guts and Casca, which is hate. Like, she hates, hates the him. shit out of Guts. Yeah. And that evolves, too, through hatred reviled respect and then love. and then love yeah and then griffith you're really you're always kind of left ambivalent to what his motivations are you get you know guts asks him i think a few points through the series why do you want me around why do you why did you make me a commander because why did he you needs s- him right and you know he's basically is like well what do you want me to say and then, you know, and then, but it's implied, I think, that there's something more going on. And you have that pivotal scene when they're initially knighted, I believe. He's the phoenix of... The the white phoenix general. The white phoenix general. Is what he gets appointed as. So um, within Midland's uh, army... Whoever holds the title of white and whatever animal it may be is the highest ranking general. Before that, it was the white tiger general. Right. But then Griffith came in and with their defeat of Tudor or Tudor, it it, it goes back and forth as to what it is at uh, the Battle of Doldry. Then he gets appointed that. And... So it, it plays out like a, a pretty much a, a, a political intrigue for most of the, the movie. Mm-hmm. There's sprinkles of other shit going on. So yeah, they <coughs> face Zod, the immortal, at one point in time. I think, is, is it the Battle of Doldry? No, it's before that. It's before that. So they they encounter this thing that's basically blocking them proceeding in battle. And they go into basically, I don't know if it's a crypt or a cellar or whatever the fuck it is. And it's killed a bunch of, of men, and it's basically when Guts comes upon it, it's feasting on one of the corpses of the of the knights. He's got, like, two of them impaled on his giant sword yes. just standing there. And when Guts discovers him, Zod the Immortal, who has been in the uh, world of Berserk, um, there has been this warrior who supposedly has been alive for hundreds of years named Zod the Immortal who's killed countless people and is supposed to be a mercenary that people, you know, are completely scared of. They call him Nosferatu Zod yes. because he seems to be, you know, uh, unaging, undying, always something there. And um, what Zod really is is what's known as an apostle in the Berserk world, which we'll probably get to later yeah. on as we talk about what happens after the eclipse. Yeah. But um, he, count, he encounters this mythical warrior, and they have a fight, and, yeah, shit happens. So in this, you, you come to understand that Griffith and Guts are special because in that, Guts initially fights Zod, and he's impressed. Zod the Immortal is impressed by his skill... To be the only person to injure him in over a hundred years. A hundred years. And Guts is about to fall to Zod. Griffith comes in, and they gang up on him. And they cut off an appendage, either a hand or an arm or something. So, yeah, Griffith 
uh, and Guts do a tandem attack on him, and Griffith ends up cutting off one of Zod's arms, but that's not shown in the movie version. They do not show his arm getting cut off See, in the movie, so that's one of the mix. changes. But they fight him. Zod's happy because he's finally encountered two humans who are powerful enough to injure him. And, and, then, and then when Griffith is down and Zod is about to do the death strike against Griffith, he discovers the egg of the king. Yes. So around Griffith's neck, he wears a necklace. And at the end of this necklace is a red-shaped, um, uh, what's called a behelt yes. in this universe. Egg-shaped thing with a face on it that will ultimately realize his fate or seal his fate or decide things and yeah when that happens it's bad when zod sees this he flies off and, he, the, and the battle's done and he gives a cryptic warning he says when griffith's ambition fails you will all be doomed or something along those lines when his ambition fails or comes to fruition, yes. perhaps, is more like it. So that's, you know, that's earlier on in the series. And that kind of gives you, like, there's something more happening in this world. We're not really sure what the hell is going on. And so that's your first hint that that's something more than a, a medieval, you know, political intrigue thriller mm -hmm. piece, if you yeah, will. Yeah, just more than ultimately... Griffith's goals are to obtain his own kingdom. Yeah. That is his motive. Yes. And he will do that by whatever means necessary. And as we find out later on at the Battle of Doldry, the, the governor who's in charge of the the fortress, Doldry is a like a castle fortress, at one point in the past had hired Griffith's band of the hawk um, to do work for them, but also had Griffith's body yeah. as it's, well. It's not explicitly said, but it is heavily implied that they had a romantic relationship. And oh, it was yeah. more so in the series yes. than and, the movie kind of just brushes over it. And and that's the movies are really good. If you want to get into it for the story in a shorter amount of time with... Um, perhaps better visuals, although that's a th topic of debate, debate because the movies are done in a 3D style animation rather yeah, than cell, traditional cell animation, rather than traditional hand-drawn ones. Um, the battles are really brutal and yes, well done in the movie versions. But the problem with the movie versions is that we glance over a lot of the emotional development that happens, and a lot of that I feel is really important. Um, especially for Griffith, because we see his almost what I consider a descent into just being a crazy motherfucker. Yes. In the series, there are many times, and the series mirrors the manga, almost like panel for panel for a lot of things. And you get to see, like, Griffith's crazy eyes quite a bit. Like, he plots a lot of shit. There are big things missing in the movie. In the movie... You don't see him kill the Queen of Midland. You see that in the series. You see that in the manga. So there's a lot of like big important things that pass by. Yep. And and for all of them, for Casca and Guts, you miss out on a lot of the the character development, and the motivations. So I, I don't know if it would say start with the movies, go to the series, do the series, do the movies. I don't really know what the right I mean, order is. Technically, if I were to say to someone, if they were getting into it, if they didn't want to read through everything, I would start them with the 97 series, then have them watch the three-part movie series, and then have them move on to the newer, the 2016 series. Gotcha. So, yeah, as and basically the, the three movies track the course of Griffith's Basically, his unstoppable ability to gain favor, status, position. Victory. He's, victory. He is an unparalleled military tactician. He has the best people working for him. And what I like about the series is 
the fact that you really never know does Griffith actually care, have some sort of feeling for Guts or Casca, or is it purely because he understands the value of what people could do for him? I think it's the latter. I think it's that. I mean, I, he sees Guts, he sees Casca, he sees their ability, and he knows he has to take advantage of their abilities to obtain what he wants, to further what he gets. And He's really the Hannibal Lecter of the military world. Or, or I mean, he is just like a no emotion, just like a machine. What I will say, the there is, and we'll, we'll get up to that point. What makes me question that is there's a line in the, the last movie leading up to the events where he throws like some anger at guts because he basically says, you're the only person that ever made me waver from my goals. So that makes me kind of wonder a little bit like, and what I like about the series is, and I think maybe this is probably prevalent in a lot of uh, Japanese storytelling is a lot of things are left ambiguous and you can read into your, uh, read into them as you want. And I think that's a much more powerful a way of telling a story than being so like explicitly telling someone's backstory and yada, 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 like leave it to our imaginations to figure out, is it, it, is it this thing or is it not this thing? So Griffith is clearly as, as brilliant as he is. He's also heavily disturbed. He's a very bad guy. He's a very bad person and he keeps his composure and can read a room better than anyone. So he knows if someone's trying to plot to assassinate him. He knows exactly how to strike, where to strike. He's he's brilliant in, in all of these ways. Cold and, and calculating. But he does seem to have these... I think what leads the fulcrum of how we get to the eclipse and what's going on is that when Guts leaves... Oh, he totally the, loses his cool and flips his fucking lip. Yeah. So Griffith... Well, excuse me. So Guts decides to leave the band of the Hawk after essentially gr- overhearing Griffith saying he doesn't have any friends. He consider a friend to him would be his equal, and they could only be his friend if they are uh, pursuing their own dreams. He right. doesn't like respect anyone that is riding his coattails. Yeah, if he if they're following him, he can't be cons- they can't be not he or he, he or she whoever can't be considered his friend or equal. So this fucks with guts and kind of starts him on this this crisis of... Which, I should say, previous to him overhearing this conversation where Griffith says that, he ends up killing the king's brother and his son on his order. Now, what I think is interesting, the difference between the series and the movie in that scene. In the movie, they play a little more sympathetic to guts. He, he kills the brother... But that doesn't see who is sneaking in. So it's played like someone's overhearing him and he just reacts and drives his sword and then realizes that it's the kid. In the series, he sees the kid, knows exactly who he is, and does it anyways. So I think that's an interesting, Mm -hmm. you know... I would have to go back to the manga and see how they portray it in that. Yeah, so that's an interesting... Again, it's a little bit of difference in the series... Anyways, that him leaving the band of the hawk, guts leaving the band of the hawk, sets in motion the fuck mind fuckery and like complete tonal shift in the whole series. So basically, Griffith loses his shit, fucks the king's daughter, and again we're talking about medieval politics, which means you don't fuck outside of. Wet, being your wet. cousin, <laughs> and he's of a lower status on top of it, mm-hmm. and he and he's get, he's caught basically banging the king's daughter, and is imprisoned and tortured, loses the bailet, and basically is turned into a husk of a human being, and is cru- he's like totally fucking crushed. He's just withered. Like they cut his Achilles tendons. They cut the tendons in his legs and his cut arms. Cut his tongue out. Cut his tongue out. Cut his dick off. Cut most of his skin off. Cut most of his face off. I mean, you don't specifically see this, but you know all this has been done. Yeah. Like, he's still wearing his helmet. He's wearing no other clothes but bandages. 
and the helmet from his armor, which is shaped kind of like a hawk. And it's so heavy at this point that it's a basically it's a torture device. Mm-hmm. So they keep it on him, and when he gets finally rescued, they have to put it back on him because his face is so horrifically disfigured that they can't look upon it. Mm-hmm. And so this, they rescue him because Guts is left, doesn't really know what happened, doesn't know the, the events mm-hmm. that have come upon the band of the hawk after Guts leaves. Yes, because of Guts' poor decision with the princess, the whole band of the hawk is Griffith, basically, yeah, yes, because of what Griffith does with the princess. After he gets busted, the whole band of the hawk pretty much has a death sentence put on them. Yep. They're being hunted down and killed. Exactly. And so Casca, along with a few other of the the sideline characters, run off and basically this whole time are planning to do a rescue. And it's not until conveniently that Guts rejoins them that they're able to execute this plan because Guts, Guts is like the Terminator, basically. Like he's just an unstoppable, no matter what you do to him, you could drive an arrow through this dude's hand, and he'll still slay mm-hmm. 70 people. And I mean, the band of the Hawk has so much love for Guts that, you know, they're before he came back, they're downtrodden, they're being hunted, they're on the point of exhaustion, don't know if they can go on any further, and then Guts shows up, everything's okay, Yeah, everything's going to be all right, they get their second wind, and then yeah. they're back in action. So they, they pull off this basically this heist, rescue him. Griffith is all fucked up beyond words. And they get him back to camp. He does some... In the, in the movie, he does this maneuver. I don't know, like, what comes over him, if he has, like, a flashback. I don't remember what it is. He somehow has enough strength to get this carriage going, and this carriage just takes off. Gus and Casca are chasing out. Everyone's chasing after the carriage. He crashes the damn thing into a lake. And while... He gets injured, I know, and he's about to kill himself. There's yeah, a, he a piece of wood sticking up, and he's about to kill himself. And conveniently, right next to his hand is the egg of the king. Is the egg of the king, and he he grabs a hold of it, and then I don't know if he puts it on his neck. He does. He blood drips on it from the wound in his neck from when he tries to stab himself on the sharp piece of wood, and the eclipse happens. And the eclipse happens. And that is when shit gets all Clive Barker. Yes, definitely very Clive Barker. So, in essence, what we've been sort of hinted at up to this point is that some bad shit's going to throw down when the fruition of his ambition either fails or succeeds, however you want to find I don't really know. And he meets the hand of God? The God hand. The God hand. And it's four fucked up looking Clive Barker demon creatures. And basically like they're when the eclipse happens, they're like transformed into like this hellscape. The band of the hawk, Casca, Guts, Griffith. Mm-hmm. And the God Hand basically propose to him that if he's willing to sacrifice his entire band of the hawk, that he will become a dark god mm-hmm. and part yeah. of the God Hand. Yes, what's most it's sacrifice what is most important to you. So, yeah. His particular behelt that he has, the egg of the king, a red one, every all the other ones that you see are gray. This one means that he will be the fifth member of the god hand, the fifth and final member of it. And uh so Gus is trying like in the movie like this like, there's all these faces that are on the floor. Yeah. So basically, like, the eclipse happens, the band of the hawk is transported to, I guess, another dimension might be the best way to describe it, a horrific dimension where they are all to be uh, marked for the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So each one of them is branded with a, like, a rune-style character, it shows that they are to be sacrificed. And while they are here and marked, all the apostles, so other people who have used uh, Behelts before, are there to consume them as yes. a sacrifice. Yes. So you now get 
what's left of the band of the hawk being pursued, eaten, and killed by horrific monsters. And I'm talking Clive Barker, like all teeth, exaggerated limbs, giant head, no body, limbs, spikes, like grotesque in a David or David Cronenberg kind of fashion. Like yes. these things are fucking crazy. And the God Hand themselves are fucking straight out of Clive Barker action. Like one looks like the Chatterer, one looks like Butterball. There's yes. a female like sexy succubi yes. sort of one. There's like this tiny one that floats around. Like, and then like the very tall Mars attacks. Yep, with the, like the brain showing and like yeah. the spectacles for eyes, like and hooks holding the mouth or bits of the mouth open as far as possible, so it's just basically teeth. Yeah, it's it's some crazy shit. Guts very is tr- cenobite. Yeah, very cenobite action. Guts during this time. So like, what happens is they come into the picture. This hand made of like skulls or flesh propels Guts and Griffith up into this dimensional sky where the four of the four God hand members are there and basically propose to him. Gus is trying to save him because he doesn't know what the fuck's going on and is cast off down the, the giant arm thing. And the God hand proposes to sacrifice what is most important to you. And he says, yes, and he does it. And they're all marked at that point. Yes. And he goes, Griffith, Gets cocooned, I suppose? Yeah, so he's basically being reborn. As a new Cenobite. Yes, as as now a god hand. So he's going from his withered, broken body to being reborn as, A, what he used to look like as a human, and B, his new god hand form. Yes. And during this time, that's when all hell breaks loose, and all of the other... So and I didn't catch that correlation because I don't think it was explicitly told in the movies that so those other creatures are the ones that had the gray baylets. Bayhelts, yes. Bayhelts. So at some point in time, they had gone through a traumatic experience, and when they were at their most hopeless, they had the chance to be turned into something else as well. Now they aren't as high in the spectrum of power as. Griffith, who is now being turned into Femto, as he is known right. in his But God they morph. Form. When you first see them, they kind of just like these weird. Like, I almost say they kind of look like from Attack on Titan, like the weird things. Mm-hmm. And then they turn into the, the, these absolutely grotesque monsters yeah. once they've been marked. And Guts makes, makes it back up. He confronts Griffith in his new god hand form, which is like this black leathered, winged, fucking crazy looking thing. And Hawk. Hawk. But like bat demon thing, whatever the fuck that is. And he proceeds to rape Casca in like the most horrific. One of the things I, I didn't, I guess we haven't looped on, is how absolutely graphic this series is. Like, the sex scenes are absolutely graphic. Mm -hmm. The depiction of of rape and torture of Casca during this time, I'm just like, holy fuck, what the hell am I watching? And so he's raping Casca because Griffith knows that they love each other and that is their only connection. Because at some point in time during the series, they both recognize that they will never get Griffith's love or affection or to be viewed as equal to him. Like, they understand, I think, after that point where he's talking about the princess. Guts and ca- Casca. Casca. That's how they, they feel. They will never... So instead of trying to pursue Griffith, they kind of end up pursuing each other. Yes, and they end up together. And they end up together. And so he knows this and commits absolute atrocities upon her. And in the series, doesn't really shy away from that at all. Mm-hmm. Like he, Directly in front of Guts. Like, it is yeah. on purpose. Like, I am doing this, and you're watching this, as he's being forced to watch. And he... And so Guts attempts to go and rescue her. He gets trapped by one of the demons, has his arm cut off, like, in what? teeth. Oh, he he pulls cuts it. his he arm cuts off. He cuts his arm off to escape to... And the one figure that we didn't talk about at all which I didn't fucking understand, is, I don't know if it's like a former potential god hand, 
comes in and rescues Casca and Guts. Ah, uh, the Skull Knight. The, the skull most mysterious character in the series. Right. And he comes in and rescues them, and he actually battles Zod, because Zod protects the portal, the gateway to the dimension from other people entering. Mm-hmm. In the movie, you don't see what happens. You just see they battle, sort of, and then the Skull Knight... Mm-hmm. is there and he rescues them. So yes, the Skull Knight is basically the eternal enemy of the God Hand. I don't know what the fuck he is. It, in the movies, they don't explicitly say. He basically saves them. Mm-hmm. And So as we go later, you do find out a little bit more. Nothing is specifically stated, but there is plenty to imply mm. who and what he is and what he was to the God Hand. And what happened? So yeah, and is that does that go through in the series or does that later after the series? So, in the series and then later in the series, I forget if they really touch on it in the movie. But you get a I can't remember if if it's the movie or the series, but you get a little taste early on when they go to rescue Griffith. That's in the movie his, from his where he's in prison. The very bottom of the that very pit. bottom of the pit. You see that there's branded skeletons. And they might mention something about Emperor Geyseric. Yes. And do. it's sort of implied that Emperor Geyseric is a survivor from a previous uh, eclipse as well. Sort of similar to Guts. Yes. And so, needless to say, Griffith fulfills his destiny and basically starts an apocalypse, I guess. That's what it's implied. Pretty much. It is an hell apocalypse. Hell hell is unleashed into the world and basically because guts has the brand he will be forever chased by these spirits Mm -hmm. demonic forces and basically when guts wakes up he's tries to find casca and she's reverted to a childlike state like she's lost her damn mind she's gone crazy from the traumatic events that have happened i would too i would certainly wish that would happen to me as well and but he goes to the to the night. They kind of see, or the night appears out of fog again. The skull knight, yep. Skull knight, and is that that point that he gets the sword from the skull knight? Well, he sword? he just takes it from him to fight off the the spirits that are pursuing him. And from this point on, now that he's marked with the brand, will forever pursue him. So, and then the movie just basically ends there. I mean, you don't really get anything after that. And you know, the series ends there too. So the series, a lot of people who weren't familiar with the manga were like, that's the end. That's the worst ending I've ever seen in anything because it's the most horrific ending to something that you could see. And, but they don't know that, you know, that was just that part. The series went on. There is more. And the movie covered that as well. But, uh, we did get a little taste afterwards. Hopefully there will be more episodes, but it's the newer episodes have gotten a lot of negativity associated with them because of the style that they took, which is also, sure. again, uh, 3D cel-shaded animation. I So my thoughts overall for Berserk is, and this is kind of really why I love anime in Japan in general, how they do things, because they synthesize other cultures so well and then mix it with their sensibilities to create something that's really fresh. Like, I like, maybe in a sense that they're not so sensitive to certain cultural... Like, here, you know, in America, we're sensitive about cultural appropriation and how we represent. And I'm saying, yes, we need to be respectful of other people's traditions and things like that, but the Japanese aren't being disrespectful. They're just not afraid to take a left turn and incorporate it with their other uh, things that are familiar to them and take it in a new direction. So I think they're, they still are respectful, but then they very thoroughly make it imbued with their own culture. And, and you know, Japan is rich with culture. They've been, you know, that culture, you know, that, those people, they've been around forever and have, so many things going on, so much lore, so much mythos, and it's such a specific culture that when they get their hands on something, they just do a really interesting job. And I think, number one, 
the medieval aspect of it I thought was interesting. Yeah, There's like very it. European medieval aspect to yes. be specific. But it's similar because if you think about medieval Europe and say like the Shogun or Samurai, they're a very strict code of moral and ethics. Knights, medieval knights were expected to act in a particular way mm-hmm. and having fealty and doing all those things. I think that they could understand that kind of cultural thing mm-hmm. very yeah. well with being, you know, having their particular, because they're, you know, as a group of people, very tradition based and respect based. So they, they take that, they put their spin on it, they're a little different uh, perspective. And, but then you get thrown for this total loop where you're like, where the fuck does this Clive mm-hmm. Barker Hellraiser shit come to? You would never expect that. It takes a huge 180, yes. You would never expect that from an American or a European uh, series. Uh, if they, You know, I wouldn't expect that from anyone to take that big of a turn. And that's what I like about Japan is that they take all of these different influences and all of these various things and they and they mash them together. Sometimes it's successful. Most most times successful. Sometimes it's not. But that's what I like a, a lot about whenever they take something about European culture and and tilt it. And I like that they do different character choices. They don't go for the obvious, at least for American audiences. So Guts, his motivations. Yes, he's a loner. But he doesn't go through this typical story arc of a Western a protagonist. Same with Casca. Same with Griffith. They, they have different notes and journeys that we would get here, which is good always prevails. The good is good, and they're boring. The bad is bad, and they're boring. And it's just, it isn't as interesting. They're, the ideas of black and white and good and bad are much more complex. The, I, there's certainly no, there's no good guy in no. Berserk. No, there's no good guy. You're absolutely right. Guts and Casca might be the closest, but Guts, again, he he assassinates. Guts is a killer and now out for revenge is his motivation. Yeah. And Casca maybe is maybe the closest to it because she doesn't do anything overtly evil. But she doesn't do anything good either. No, she kills. And she's the commander of killers. And I... Well, you know, I, I like that. And just how people are, you know, maybe hook up and how Guts and Casca end up together. Like, I like that it's not like they fell in love and realized the magic of each other. Like, it's only after they've lost everything and the idea of, like, gaining the affection from the, the person that they're really trying to gain it from that they find each other. I think is an interesting... Again, I, like... But yeah. their relationship is very fucked up as well, which is totally glanced over in the movie and the series in comparison to the manga. Because so there's I've, some not good juju going on there either. So I've not read the ma- I, like, having seen the movies, having gone through the, uh, going through the, the initial series, like, I definitely want to hit back on the manga and see what's going on with that because I keep seeing these memes about like the rapey horse. Yes, that's later. Oh, that's later. Yeah, so and that's post Golden Age arc. Okay. So there's there's a lot of material, a lot that's not covered in any animated form. Okay. See, and that's where I need to get to the manga and really dive into a lot of these mm-hmm. things. I and I find. Yes, because you're going to get even more of the emotional development that you get in the uh, 97 series. You're getting more on top of that, and you learn more things that happen. So, like, a lot of bad things, like, Guts did not have a good childhood. No. I mean, he was born out of a corpse, basically. His mother was killed, and then he was born after she had died. He was brought into this mercenary group where he was... I wouldn't even say raised by a terrible quote unquote father figure who would sell guts off to be raped by other people of the mercenary troop that he was in. And then ultimately uh, guts had to kill his father figure and do this. And then Casca was 
sold to a noble who then tried to rape her but was saved by Griffith and given the chance to join him. And there's a lot of bad stuff going it's, on. It's like Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones. Like, that's the level of, like, depravity and, like, yeah, terrible shit. I mean, shit. The, no one has a good story and no one goes anywhere good in this. I mean, it's just bad things happening to people that continually gets worse. And I guess I've always that's what I've always appreciated about a lot of Japanese storytelling. Like Japanese horror films, a lot of them don't end with the good prevailing. Like it just ends and it's terrible like everyone dies. And I I guess there's something about that that I like because I I feel like in a lot of ways it's more realistic and it's just so different than a lot of what we do in Western culture. And so I have a lot of respect for Berserk. And I love the fact that it, it gets a rise out of me. Like, I'm actually like, WTF, what the fuck is going on? Like, if something does that to me, it elicits a reaction that is not bored. Like, I think it did a good job. Uh, you know, and I, I again, you know, it, the relationship between Gus and Griffith... It's sort of, it's, it's like sometimes like Griffith, it almost seems like he's seducing Guts. Mm -hmm. But that's a skill of someone who's like highly influential and that kind of thing. Yeah. Like very charismatic personalities. Right. So it's like. But there is some, there is like a little flavor of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? homoeroticism yes but i think it's very clearly state at least in the series that griffith is willing to do whatever he needs to do to achieve his goals yes and he has no limits and that's really what leads him to the end of the golden Mm -hmm. age yes nothing will stop him he will get what he wants he will do whatever it takes he will kill whoever he he needs to kill he will will sacrifice his entire mercenary troop to achieve his goals. And I think that's, I like that we get to see that kind of personality taken to the extreme and done with a no holds barred, no redemption. Griffith is not a redeemable character. No, at not all. at all. And I like the fact that he is allowed to achieve his goals and, see what the outcome of that is as opposed to always being stopped. Like, you know, cause like if, if this is done in America, he would have been stopped. The good guy would have prevailed. No bad things would have happened to Casca. Like there's certain lines you do not cross in storytelling that I feel like the Japanese don't give two fucks. Like they don't, they don't care. They know nothing is safe. Well, at least by our perspective, nothing is safe to them. I'm, I'm sure there are things that they don't touch on and their culture that uh, we probably would. I don't. And, you know, it's weird. You've got this person who's like throwing away all human aspects to achieve what he wants. But throughout the progression of the golden age arc, you've got guts becoming more human. And what I like is more powerful as the series progresses. Guts becomes more and more of a force to be mm-hmm. reckoned with. He is, he is without a doubt, by far, the most powerful human. Like, there is no one stronger than him. And the only person who would be his equal, he did kill. And that's another thing which reminds me of the differences between the movie and the series, is how Guts takes out General Boscon and... If you haven't got to that part in the series yet. I haven't. I am really excited. I want to rewatch that with you. Okay. Uh, I think I'm actually really close to that, if not on the episode of that. Okay. Uh, I really feel like we should watch that as soon as we're done. We should just watch more of Berserk. Because uh, then the sooner we get through that, the sooner we can get into the 2016 series. Yeah. And then we can have a discussion about that because that is... Because of the polarizing effect that that's had, that is something that I'm really passionate about and I really want to talk about. Yeah, I, you know, I, listen, so the movies I thought were exciting. The sheer brutality of them, the violence of them, 
And I don't, like, I'm not saying, like, I love violence because I am a sadistic fetishist, but I think things should be displayed as they are, and I think, yes, it's over the top in some degree, but it doesn't shy away, and I think when you don't shy away from something, you really get to understand the consequence of those things, and you really get the sense that, as you said, there is no one more powerful than Guts. Like, he is a beast and he could be impaired and still he is a one man army he is all by himself and that's an incredible thing and I'm curious there's other things in the movie they hint at a fairy and then you see it he's it's hinted at and then it's never mentioned ever again Mm -hmm. in the series you get more like fairy dust and healing properties Mm -hmm. of it and that sort of thing uh, I'm curious if there is, at the end of it, if if guts actually is some sort of like mythological, powerful thing because he his strength is beyond anything else. His strength human. is his determination in revenge, really. And you know, much like I was saying earlier, how the Golden Age arc is, you know, your European like story, and then it goes into horror and. Also, high fantasy. So, post-Eclipse, these worlds of the human world and the spirit world and all those kind of things are forced to merge because of what happens with Griffith. And then you get to see more of the fairies and goblins and that kind of thing. All that starts to come out then. And I'm really... So... And I suppose not all of this has been explored yet because... As you're saying, the kind of the running joke is that the creator takes these huge, long hiatuses. Yeah, so it writing. started in 89. It's still going, and it hasn't finished. And that's, But the, isn't there a gigantic amount of, novel, of, of series of novels? Not a gigantic amount, no. Really? So it's not like Bleach? Okay. So, no, it's not terrible. <laughs> I mean, so at the end of the day, if you're looking for something that is a really good, like I would, for anyone that's getting into this, I would say it's equivalent as far as storytelling and intensity would be Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. If you want to watch a series that is intense, that's high fantasy, that's high concept, that has a lot of, I would say it's just as accurate to medieval politics as Game of Thrones is. Uh, then Berserk is the way to go. And specifically those movies, mm-hmm. I really like, because it gives you a really good snapshot of the overall. And you could dive mm-hmm. deeper after that point. Yeah, so it's like, it's dipping your foot in the pool, you get a taste for it, and if you like it, you can jump all the way in. And yeah. the nice thing about the movies is that they're all available on Netflix. Yeah. So and that's, that's easy access right away there. Easy access. I, again, I, I got into it, and it was one of those things, like... I am very guilty of starting a movie and then just getting up and walking away and starting to do other things while the movie's playing. It engaged me fully through all three movies. I'm like, I gotta fucking watch the next one. I gotta do the next one. Like, I'm terrible at like getting up and starting a project and kind of like half paying attention to movies a lot of times if it doesn't engage me. I like to I like to binge shows on Netflix to do other things like yes. I'm going to put this on but I'm going to be on my phone or I'm going to be doing something else. Yeah. It's just there in the background as something to like sometimes pay attention to. And I feel like and here's my own personal thing with a lot of like either watching movies or binging or doing anime series is that I feel it's more challenging to me if I like miss out on a bunch of it so that I don't know what's going on to force me to have to figure it out. Because if I watch it and actually pay attention, I'll figure out where it's going really quick. So I like, sometimes like, I'll be honest with you, I'll skip episodes and just like go into something like half cocked and have like, what the fuck is going on and have to piece it together. What the fuck is wrong with you? (laughs) Otherwise, I mean, otherwise I get bored. If I know, you know, if it's a really obvious story especially if it's supposed to be like a mystery and i figure out the mystery in the first five minutes i'm gonna have a hard time staying invested in it 
So sometimes I just skip out on episodes. <laughs> it's just so I have to figure it out. I'm a terrible person. And I'm a terrible person to watch TV with sometimes. I will admit that. I feel sorry for it. Maybe that's why I'm single. I can invest in with shows with ladies. And I'm no like, comment. Oh. I <laughs> <laughs> So, I'll refrain from saying anything about that one. Yeah, indeed. So I, you know, but Berserk is one of those things that it engaged me. I didn't want to skip any episodes. I didn't want to. And to me, that's high praise. We could go into the to the discussion about, you know, how shitty some people feel the animation was. Uh, I think in the service of the story, the style, everything, it was completely. It was more than adequate. The series, again, the only thing I have to complain about the series is the opening song. Because, like, that theme song is, like, clearly someone who doesn't speak English and they mouth English words. And it's like they use Google Translate oh, to make man. a song. It's awesome. I love it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's so, so ridiculously ridiculous. funny. It's great. Uh, yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's like that fucking off key guitar playing that really fucking gets me. What the fuck? I don't even know what it is. And, um... The intro music, though, for the two series of the new ones is fucking awesome, though. Yeah. But, you know, the funny thing with, like, going back to the series, the music that was actually in the episodes and the outro music was fantastic. Oh, yeah. The person who's been doing the music for Berserk has been, like, has done all all of them. How the fuck did they get to that theme song? For I don't know. It's great, though. I, I It has its own charm, to be sure. Just put your grasses on. <laughs> Nothing will be wrong. Nothing will be wrong. So I, I don't really have anything else to say. I You know, I think it's, it's a great story. It's a classic. It's one of those things. It's meme-worthy. It's there's I think a lot of people reference that series because it's such a unique. I follow two thing. Instagram accounts that are strictly Berserk memes. <laughs> exactly, it's it's iconic upon itself. And if you haven't seen it, experienced it, we I could say, if if you aren't shy on violent stuff, if you aren't, you know, sensitive to topics like rape and that kind of thing i mean give it a shot but otherwise stay away from it if you are because it yeah. is not good if that's the I case would say there's okay going back to it and they do this much more in the movies than they do in the series there's one flaw to it that kind of irked me a little bit because it played into the idea that casca is a weaker person commander so in the movie, they're in a, a very pivotal battle, and it's very clearly shown that Casca gets her period during this. Yeah, it's really And she up. loses her strength and ability to focus and to do anything, and she basically becomes helpless, thus drawing guts to save her. They fucking fall. Like, she's really prone to falling off cliffs for whatever reason. And... So they fall off a cliff. Stay away from them cliffs. <laughs> and they fall to the water, and Guts discovers that she's on her period. And that's what, like, somehow that makes her less strong and capable, and she becomes helpless. Which, to me, I'm like, that's, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure that's not how that works. No, and then uh, I also want to say that's, like, so typical of a Japanese man to write something like that, too. So I thought that that was kind of... I mean, it's actually interesting that that's different than how it would be portrayed in Western culture, because in Western culture, she'd be a raging hobgoblin devouring people. But in Japan, somehow they're weaker. And that irked me a little bit. Like, that's oh, yeah. like of all, <laughs> of all my gripes with the graphic violence and all those things, it, it kind of took me, I'm like, huh. That's that's not a thing. That's not really. I don't agree with you on that. Um, I well, yeah, definitely didn't agree with that. So th that's like my major qualm with, again, the rules of the the world and the story and that sort of thing. So that irked me a little bit. But overall, I recommend it. I highly suggest it. You need to watch it if you're listening. If you've taken the time to listen 
to this episode, one, you've already seen the series. Probably. Or two, you maybe like what we have to say about shit and you want to... Maybe you're interested. Maybe you're interested. I Just get into it. It's it's weird. It's great. It's unexpected. And I almost about, feel like we did a disservice if somebody hasn't had any interest oh yeah, in it. spoiled the shit. And now they're going to watch it and they'll be like... Oh, here's this regular thing going, and they won't have the what the fuck is happening now. And the yeah, we ruined moment. it. So, you know, again, we always encourage people to engage with us. And, if, you know, if you have another opinion, please seek us out on Twitter or Instagram and, and uh, talk to us about Berserk. I really love Berserk. We'll talk about it. And, and we'll I can't it. wait till we have another episode where we talk about the new series. Yeah. But until then, this is Eric. And this is Kyle. And we will catch you in the next episode.